Uh, I don't know if I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or not, an hour and a half, uh, because I've never talked about this before. This is a topic I never really thought about. But when Mary McIntyre was putting this program together, uh, I guess she had in mind a certain number of lectures. And I think she was one short. So she said, well, couldn't you talk about uh, rice in the world or rice in Houston or something like that? And this was months ago. So I, you know, I just said, sure, not, not sort of not really thinking about it. But uh, here it is, so uh, I'll start. Uh, and it, what she said, what Mary asked me to talk about was how rice had interacted with Houston, with, the, with sort of the larger community, over the period of its history. Uh, in part, I think her uh, agenda was that you know, there, there, there for years was a, a sort of a rumor or a myth or maybe sometimes more reality than we wanted to admit that Rice students and faculty and administration sort of hid behind the hedges here and didn't pay much attention to uh, Houston and felt uh, isolated from or different from or better than or something from the rest of the community. And uh, that obviously, that many times I think was a misperception, but misperception shapes history and attitudes as strongly and as realistically as facts do. So one of the things that Rice has been doing uh, very uh, carefully in the last 20 years or so is to correct that perception or misperception that Rice didn't have much concern or care for the larger community. So I, I think that's one of the things that she wanted me to talk about because obviously uh, if you're the dean of the School of Continuing Studies, uh, a large part of your mission, if not the largest part of your mission, is to have Rice reach out to the larger community. Because most people, most students taking a typical continuing studies class, uh, they are not Rice graduates, they're not alums. And so one of the nicest things about continuing studies is how it has sort of reached out to the larger, er the larger region. But uh, in fact, Rice, throughout its history, has had a sense of obligation to the larger society. And I want to talk about in, in eight or ten different ways how Rice has reached out to the local community, to the state, to the nation, and in fact now to the world. And I would like to point out that when, on the, when the physics building was built, that's the building right over there, on the cornerstone of that building, it was finished in 1915, there is an inscription written, of course, by Edgar Odell Lovett, that has the phrase, science in the service of society. And it said science in the service of society because the physics lab at the, originally was basically all the science labs. So uh, he meant that in a very real sense that Rice should serve the nation. And I know that that was very much Lovett's attitudes because I've you know, read his letters and papers and so forth. But remember I said in that very first lecture how influenced Lovett was by his a sojourn as a member of the faculty at Princeton. And when, in the uh, couple of years before he went to Princeton, Princeton uh, celebrated its 150th anniversary. And Woodrow Wilson, who at that time was a professor of political science at Princeton, gave the keynote address. And it was entitled, Princeton in the Service of the Nation. And it was a very famous lecture and it was published in the volume that celebrated Princeton's uh, 150th anniversary. But Lovett clearly read and knew that talk. And in that talk, uh, Woodrow Wilson had said that a university trains, at that time it was an all-male, trains men. Very few of these men, he said, will become scholars themselves, but they will take leading positions in the world. So that a university must learn how to teach people, to teach themselves for the rest of their life, and to learn to take up leadership positions. And that a great national university like Princeton had to understand that its mission was uh, of national importance. That was the 150th anniversary. Later, when uh, Woodrow Wilson became president of Princeton, his inaugural address was on the almost exactly the same topic. Uh, and then again, he spoke very much about, more positively about science than he had previously, but that science and humanities both were to be studied in college, not because 
the students would themselves become professors or PhDs or researchers, but in fact, the great majority of them would go out into the world as architects and engineers and businessmen and so forth, so that how they were trained in Princeton would end up, and of course, this is the Princeton attitude, you know, Princeton's going to lead the nation, so these people will be leaders of the nation. So Lovett very much had that idea in mind, and when he came to Rice and when he spelled out the purpose of Rice in 1912, he spent a lot of time talking about how a university has to understand its society and that it cannot be just looking inward. And in his uh, opening addresses, he talked about to, talking to the people of Houston. He said he hoped that people of Houston would come out and use Rice almost as a park. And they would come out uh, taking almost like a, a brief vacation in the middle of the day from the uh, furor and the pace and so forth of the business life and walk out and he said you know walk among the groves of trees and walk under the arches and so forth and be contemplative and that wherever they were educated he hoped that they would come to somehow feel that rice was their intellectual home forever so he's going to spell out in 1912 a number of ways in which rice will serve the larger community but even before rice opened rice in a interesting way the rice endowment served the community Remember I said that when the, when the, uh, after the death of William Marsh Rice and then the trial that proved that, 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 that his, uh, the f will was fake and they settled the dispute with the second wife and when the estate finally came to the trustees that the, the estate, roughly $5 million, was the seventh largest endowment of any institution in the nation. But it was by far the biggest sort of sum of money in Houston. The Rice Endowment was larger than the, the, the reserves of any bank in Houston. And the trustees at this time knew that in, that in some sense, one of their obligations, their ultimate obligation was to establish a university. But before that could happen, they had to grow this money. And this was an age when they were quite cautious and they, never, they would never invest money in, in the stock market. In fact, they, when they finally in 1942 decided that they should invest money in buying an oil field, they actually went to the Attorney General to get permission to use Rice money to buy an oil field, even though the oil field ended up bringing them in the, in a, a roughly $40 million. And they spent a million for it, so they were very, very cautious. So here are the trustees then, many of them had connection with banks, sitting on a huge sum of money. And Houston was a new town with a lot of builders needing money. So the Rice trustees, the Rice Endowment, essentially served as Houston's leading bank for the first 10 years. And if you read the minutes of the, of the, of the trustees, remember that the, the, the university gets its money in 1904. The college university doesn't open until 1912. So the trustees are meeting for years during which there's no college, there's no faculty. And you say, what are they doing? Actually, they're operating like a bank. Their minutes are primarily concerned with describing who comes to them to want money and on what terms and how much they give. I mean, Jesse Jones, for example, who's obviously famous for being sort of a great builder of Houston, and then later his foundation gives a lot of money back to Rice, but Jesse Jones comes again and again to Rice to borrow money. And Rice, of course, loans him money at interest. Jesse Jones borrows money from Rice to build what became the Rice Hotel on land that Rice owned. But again, when Jesse Jones is building early skyscrapers in Houston, the Rice Endowment is his bank. And you read through the minutes, whether it's loaning money to the YMCA or loaning money to various individuals, or loaning money to Sean Sherman Memorial Methodist Church. I mean, the, the trustees are, the minutes, they, it seems like a like, savings and loan organization. And it played a real purpose in that sort of early economic takeoff of Houston just before the opening of the ship channel in 1914. When Houston makes this incredible leap forward between, say, 1908 and 1920, the source of funds is the Rice Endowment. So long before the university opened, or the college opened, Rice was playing an important role in the economic history of Houston. And then when Rice opened, because Lovett believed so strongly that a university had an obligation to educate the larger community and to, in some sense, become the alma mater of people who actually been trained elsewhere but had moved to Houston. He laid out from the very beginning that the idea that Rice would have a large number of free public lectures. And in some sense, this was the first 
continuing studies of rice. These lectures were free. They were sort of one-shot lectures. And they were often given in auditoriums downtown because the campus didn't yet have enough classrooms and auditoriums to have uh, continuing studies. But in 1915, when Lovett actually published the published version of his long address, he listed in a footnote the public lectures that had been given in the last two or three years. And these lectures, sometimes a lecture series would have an attendance of 1,000. Again, this was an age before television and radio, and Rice was sort of the only college in town. But Lovett and Rice, in the first 10 or 15 years, felt a very important responsibility to sort of bring ideas to the community. And Lovett said these ideas should be as technical as required to sort of cover the subject, but accessible to a larger audience. And when he lists the people who gave lectures, it was sort of the who's who of the Rice faculty. Stockton Axton in English, a great Shakespearean scholar from Princeton. Harold Wilson, the first professor of biology, uh, physics, and so forth. Stockton Axton was famous for being a great lecturer. In the two or three years before he came to Rice, when he was still a famous professor at Princeton, year after year, the students at Princeton and the Princeton College newspaper listed him as the outstanding teacher at Princeton. So when he came to Rice, he was a real star, particularly for his lectures on Shakespeare. So Rice was involved in some sense in continuing studies from the very beginning. Another sort of an outreach that the early Rice did was what they call Engineering Day. And at first, Engineering Day was to be a time when students would sort of set up equipment and uh, uh, do experiments and sort of demonstrate projects. And they had no idea that this would, you know, who would show up. But it turned out to be a, a, an event of amazing popularity. And soon, the engineering days were attracting that crowds in the thousands. But it was a very important way for sort of Rice to help educate, showed that he had some concern with the larger community. Now, I'm going to talk later about the development of the School of Continuing Studies. I think it's one of the most important things that's happened at Rice. But before I get to that much later, I want to say that from this beginning of offering public lectures, Rice has, throughout its history, uh, since the responsibility of providing lectures free to the public. And I don't suppose there's a person in Houston who hasn't heard about or at the time attended one or more, you know, symposia, conferences, president's lecture series, and so forth. And these, for example, the president's lecture series, that their speakers three or four a semester, are people of international importance, and they're absolutely free. So this has been one of the kind of things that Rice has done. Also, the, the, the uh, charter that established Rice. Remember I said that that was a very vague charter that had all kinds of purposes that sometimes didn't even seem to be related to one another. But one of the purposes that, that uh, the people of Houston really appreciated, and one that Rice has always felt important to honor, was the idea that the Rice Library was to be a free public library. This is uh, unusual, if you mean if you, that, but a member of the public can walk into the Rice Library. You have to show an ID now, a picture ID, so they know that's because, I mean, that didn't used to be that way. That's a, a sort of an artifact of living in a large city now. But any person in the city can walk into the Rice Library, show an ID, and walk into the library and enter the stacks and sit down at the desk or sit at the carrel and read the books. I mean, that's really unusual for a, for a great university library. Most university libraries, you can't get in unless you pay some user fee or an alum or a student. And many of the great libraries in the nation don't have open stacks. So, you know, if you go to the Library of Congress, you go in and you give them a call number and you bring a novel to read so as you can sort of, you know, you, know, you can write letters or read a novel until a couple of hours come in which they bring you the book that you've requested. But at Rice, any person, a student or a faculty or a person off the street, can come in and simply show an ID and have access to any book in the library. Cannot check it out, of course, but can have access to it. And that actually complicates running a library for all kinds of security reasons and so forth. But because it says that in the charter, the Rice University administration and the library staff has felt that that is an obligation, that's sort of a, a trust we have with the people of, of, of Houston and we're going to live up to it. 
Another one of the kind of outreach activities that Rice has been engaged in that, uh, that cost an awful lot of money and involved an awful lot of people are athletics. Uh, Rice opened in 1912. And in 1912, Rice was among the colleges that helped put together the Southwest Conference. And Rice began playing football and basketball in the first year. Now, if you look at the schedule in 1912, there are not very many colleges around, so we're playing uh, Air Force bases and high schools and so forth. Uh, you know, you say Rice versus Galveston High School. Uh, maybe it's not a bad idea. I mean, <laughs> maybe that's better than playing Michigan or Oklahoma. But nevertheless, we, uh, from the very beginning, we, we, we were involved in intercollegiate sport. Of course, at the, at the beginning, as with most universities, the intercollegiate sport was an activity that men were involved in only. But uh, fairly early, Rice built a, a, a field house. Uh, the field house uh, had to be torn down because it wasn't built very well. And after about 20 years, huge cracks emerged in it. And there was some concern that it might fall. There are photographs in the fundering of the cracks in this library, that, in this building, field house, that you could stick your arm in. But the, uh, the, the original field house was, uh, let's see, south of the old stadium facing Main Street. And that was where the basketball games were held until Autry Court was built after World War II. That was the, that the, what we now call the old stadium, or the track stadium which is being renovated in part now to uh, where, where women's soccer will be played beginning this fall. Uh, that was uh, the biggest stadium in Houston for a number of years. And uh, in those days, the, the, of course, the Rice Stadium and the paved parking lot didn't exist. So you see, uh, and there was still a kind of a creek apart uh, where the Rice Stadium exists, Harris Gully, really. And so from early photographs, you can see automobiles parked north of the old stadium site, sort of where, where Autry Court is now, and in the paved parking lot, and little dirt trails that come down uh, from the direction of the Southwest Freeway. But athletics has, uh, has been a very important part of Rice's reaching out to the larger community from the very beginning. And people who only know Rice in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years may find it hard to believe, but in the 1940s and 50s up to about 1960, before the, before University of Houston became a member of the Southwest Conference, uh, and before there was any such thing as you know Astros and Oilers and so forth, in the in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, Rice sports, particularly Rice football, was the biggest game in town. And when the Rice Stadium was built, opened in 1950, I mean it, it seat the, the, the attendance varies. People say 70,000, 72,000, 73,000, but that stadium, you know, was built by Brown and Root at cost in nine months. They began construction at the end of one football season, and they worked around the clock for nine months. Uh, and they had the stadium open for the beginning of football season the next year. There was a f joke that people always tell about this, that George Brown was once asked, you know, will you have the stadium ready in time for the next season? And he supposedly said, well, what time is the game, afternoon or night? But I mean, they, did, they did get the game finished, and uh, I mean, they did get the building finished. It's a, it's of course, it's a spectacular structure and one of the best st stadiums in the United States. Those columns, those tall columns, Brown and Root had just been building the Gulf Freeway and those forms that made the Gulf Freeway overpass columns were used to make those tall columns holding up the upper deck. Augie Erfurth, who was, had been a, a rice track player in, in the uh, Olympics in Germany in the 1930s, had come back and had talked about he didn't like many aspects of that sort of Hitler Olympics, but he loved the stadium where you could sort of walk around the entire stadium in a kind of a pathway. And he wanted that to be incorporated into the Rice Stadium. And of course, you know, on the upper, along the lower deck, you can completely circle the field. Uh, of course, the upper decks are not connected. But when the Rice Stadium was built and opened in 1950, it was uh, you know, the, one of the grandest structures in the city. And people then, as certainly are now, were just sort of awestruck to on that flat p parking lot to drive up and then look down and see a whole stadium sort of beneath the ground. And I'm sure you've heard stories, you know, Patty Page singing you know, the Star Spangled Banner and supposedly forgetting the lines, and uh, although she disputes that, and uh, a bit early Billy Graham crusade in the uh, football stadium. But in the 50s, up to about 62 or 63, uh, 
Rice football games attracted 70, 72,000 people. And you, uh, on a number of games, when you played LSU or you played University of Texas, or played Texas A&M, that would be standing room only, 73,000 people. Now, that's kind of stunning now. You go to a football game, and unless it's Texas, they'll, you know, there'll be 10,000 or 14,000. And I have to say, we've all kind of gotten accustomed to that, you know, because you can go to concession stands so early. I mean, now you go to a game, if 35,000 are up, you're aggravated, you know. All these people are complicating going down to the concession stand. But it used to always be that way. Used to be, I mean, we used to have one of the largest attendances in, in the United States in football. But again, that was before professional sports and when Southwest Conference and Rice were, were the number one sort of event. And in those days, uh, even students wore coat and ties and, and uh, women wore hose to go to a football game. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, you look at Rice students now at a football game, it's kind of hard to imagine people there dressed up wearing coat and tie. But I'm sure some of you older alums can remember those days when, you know, when Saturday night you dressed up to go to a football game. I mean, it was a kind of a religious ceremony. It began with a prayer and, you know, and it was patriotic and you were dressed up and uh, actually Rice won a lot of games. And then times changed. Uh, but the Rice Stadium, in addition, as I've already suggested, having such things as, uh, you know, very big time college football and Billy Graham also had, you know, rock concerts and University of Houston used to play there and TSU played there and, a, you know, a Super Bowl occurred in the, in the Rice Stadium and uh, football play, uh, playoffs in high school and the Kincaid St. John's. I mean, the Rice Stadium has been a sort of an event for Houstonians for decades. And, not just simply for, for sports. I mean, before all students had cars and, and the faculty got so big, the Rice parking lot was the largest piece of uh, unobstructed pavement in the city of Houston. So thousands and thousands of Houstonians learned to drive by circling around, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, e even 30 years ago, they were still, maybe not, even that long, not that long ago, there were still places out there where you would go out and learn how to parallel park and so forth, you know, but it was, it was, not only would you learn how to ride a bike, but you actually learned how to ride a car. Of course, now there's hardly room to drive through it, but it's, uh, that was never a part of Rice's intention to serve the larger community. <laughs> but uh, uh, many, many Houstonians, their only connection with Rice was going out there to learn how to drive. And then, of course, it seems for years, you know, you couldn't have a, any kind of march or anything in the, in, the, in the city for any cause unless you began that march and maybe ended that march at the Rice Stadium. So the stadium has had sort of an impact on the popular culture in Houston in ways that no one could have imagined when they started that nine-month ferocious project in 1949.